Hello, welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to have Katie here with us today talking about evolutionary optimization for neuromorphic systems. So I want to, I would like to mention that this uh, talk is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube afterwards. <clears throat> and I would also like to say thanks to Theo Dev for providing us with the webinar version uh, so that we can continue to host these talks. Just want to say a couple of uh, words about Open Neuromorphic. Um, so this was an organization created by a couple of people who started to collaborate online really a few months ago. And uh, we just like to, you know, we just like working on open source code, hardware. We write blog posts together. And all of this stuff can be found on our website, open-neuromorphic.org. There you can also find a link to our Discord server where we are very active, um, a bunch of channels for you know any like research activity um, related to frameworks like SNN Torch. And there's a couple of upcoming talks that we're we're hosting. So actually, the next one is going to be myself. Um, then we have also someone else from Synsense talking. Uh, about um, the neuromorphic hardware, both for vision and audio models. We have someone from Intel talking about their open source framework. We have Lana from ETH talking about her research work on dynamically scheduled circuits. And so, yeah, please do. There's also a Google Calendar uh, that you can subscribe to, to so that you have all these like they are dynamically updated so you can just like have all these events in your calendar so without further ado uh, i would like to to yeah welcome katie so katie received her phd at the university uh, from uh, of tennessee working on evolutionary algorithms to train spiking neural networks uh, since then, she's worked at, uh, as a research scientist at the Oak Ridge National Labor Laboratory and more recently has moved uh, back to University of Tennessee to start as an assistant professor. Congrats on that. And uh, yeah, so the floor is, the floor is yours. I will stop sharing. Great. And I will start. And uh, sorry, just a last rem um, remark. So for people, feel free to like post your questions. If you know Katie uh, doesn't see them, uh, I will. She asked me to you know, um, basically uh, interrupt her, and um, so that we can basically talk about the questions immediately. Thank you. Sounds good. Can you see my slides? Okay. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right, well, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really excited about this community um, that you all are building. Um, and I'm hoping to um, encourage some, some creativity with the application of evolutionary uh, algorithms for neuromorphic computing um, with my talk today. So you already got a little bit about me uh, in the introduction. Um, I was at Oak Ridge National Lab for six years before I uh, came to um, back to the University of Tennessee. Um, you'll notice that I'm standing in front of a supercomputer um, in that picture. That will come into play later in this presentation. So um, just remember that I have access to a lot of compute power, um, even now in, in my role as a professor. Um, so I also wanted to acknowledge before I get into the talk, um, I'm part of a broader neuromorphic computing research group at the University of Tennessee called TenLab. Um, we do research all across the neuromorphic computing stack from devices to architectures, software, um, applications and algorithms. Um, we have affiliated faculty at a variety of institutions, and the work that I'm going to be talking about is really a collaboration between all the folks you see on the, the slide here and, and not just me. Um, lots of amazing collaborators working across all levels of, of neuromorphic computing. And if you're interested in learning more about our group and, and finding um, the publications that I'm talking about in uh, these slides, you can find them at our website, which is uh, the link is on the, the slide here. So the big thing that our research group is really trying to address in TenLab um, is a disconnect between two groups of researchers in neuromorphic computing. So we have the neuromorphic computing devices and materials researchers, of which there are a lot in the field of neuromorphic. 
Um, they know how to build really cool new neuromorphic implementations, but they don't always have the connection to algorithms or applications. Um, typically, these are people who are material scientists, uh, physicists, electrical engineers, and, and maybe they just don't have the machine learning background or the neuroscience inspiration um, or a particular application that they're, they're interested in. So we did this survey paper um, in 2017. Uh, I read over 3,000 papers uh, in neuromorphic computing. This paper almost killed me. If it's useful to you, I hope I hope that effort was useful to you. Um, but one of the questions that we were trying to ask when we were looking at um, all of the work that had been done in, across those 3,000 papers um, coming up to 2017 was how many are actually connecting the hardware platforms that they're building to an application, like even a simple application. And I'm not just talking simple as in MNIST, I'm talking simple as in like exclusive war, um, just the most basic applications. And only 27% of the papers had actually connected to some application. 73% of the papers that were introducing some neuromorphic hardware component were not connecting to any application whatsoever. So it's worth noting, I'm a computer scientist, and so it's really hard for me to read a bunch of papers about hardware and try to understand how to compare them if I don't have an application to actually connect to. So in the Tin Lab um, research group, we're really trying to bridge the gap between people who are developing neuromorphic hardware implementations and applications researchers who have interesting problems that they, they want to solve. They know that their application can benefit from neuromorphic computing but they don't have the expertise to actually you know, use a neuromorphic computer or decide what the appropriate platform to use is. So we've started building our 10 lab neuromorphic software framework. We've been working on this for about um, eight years now. Um, and the goal here is to bridge the gap between these two groups of people so that we can enable cutting edge research for both. Um, now our 10 lab neuromorphic software framework has at, at its core, um, our software that has common interfaces and we provide input and output coding mechanisms. Um, our input and output coding mechanisms take data, turn them into spikes, take spikes coming out of your network, turn it back into classification labels, actions, whatever, for the for whatever task you happen to be trying to complete. Um, I will note this is not yet open source, but we are hoping to open source our software core later this year. And when we do, I will let you know in the Discord. So definitely join the Discord. Um, so that you can you can keep up with this along with everything else this community is doing. So we have this software core with our common interfaces and our input output coding. Um, and with that, we plug in below the, the software core various hardware platforms. And we're typically working with emerging hardware. So people who have developed neuromorphic hardware platforms are developing uh, at, into our API. So they're, they're creating an interface to their hardware backend through our software core API. We also connect to a variety of different simulators um, in the spiking neural network, neuroscience, computational neuroscience, and neuromorphic community. Um, you can see a couple of them listed there. And so when you're interfacing through the software core, you can now talk to each of these different hardware backends in the same way, which means we can then develop our algorithms on top of that software core and applications on top of our algorithms. We support a, a variety of different types of algorithms. We're going to focus at this presentation, obviously, on the evolutionary algorithm um, components, but we support others. Um, and the idea here with this, this software framework is that you can plug and play. You can swap out what hardware backend you're using. You can swap out what application you're using. You can swap out what algorithm you're using um, and really study as many aspects of neuromorphic computing as you want to simultaneously. So we do a lot of work, especially through um, application hardware co-design, where we are iterating on our hardware um, using this, this full software framework stack. So when I'm talking about all of this, I'm, I'm going to be talking about it in the context of our, our 10 lab software framework, which has enabled us to explore different architectures and devices and different applications simultaneously, whereas most of what I do lives at the algorithms level. Um, and in particular, this talk is about the evolutionary algorithms. So with that, my uh, my this this journey that I'm going to tell you about started when I was a, a graduate student, um, where I was grappling with the question of how do you design a spiking neural network for a given problem, and really one of the things that I was most interested in looking at was you have the ability in a spiking neural network to have not just layered connectivity, but any neuron can be connected to any other neuron. You can have lots of recurrence. You can have feedback loops. You can have weird stuff like multi um, edges connecting two neurons. And so the question that I was trying to grapple with is how do you come up with the right spiking neural network for a given problem when you have sort of 
this level of freedom that you can explore. So not only are we asking the question, what should the weights on the synapses be, but we're also asking questions about what the network topology should look like, how many neurons, how many synapses you should need. And of course, as we all know, the synapses likely have other parameters associated with them, and the neurons have other parameters associated with them. And maybe your spiking neural network has additional components. Maybe you have an axon uh, model, you have a dendrite model, and you have parameters associated with those. So it just further complicates the picture of how you design an appropriate network. But then, of course, in neuromorphic, this is not the only problem. We also have to think about designing the right spiking neural network for the hardware platform that we're targeting. And as I'm sure you all know, and this is the, the point of uh, both great um, opportunity for creativity, but also great frustration for me as the computer scientist, is that the hardware platforms are often radically different from each other. So the types of neuron models that they support are very different. The synapse models are very different. The levels of connectivity can be very different and the underlying devices and materials can radically change how the networks function. So, which means that I, as the computer scientist, have to think about material science and device physics, which is not in my wheelhouse, but now it is, and I have to do it as a, as a neuromorphic researcher. So not only do we have to come up with the right spiking neural network structure for the problem that we're trying to solve, it also has to work for that particular hardware backend that we're targeting, the architecture, the device, and the materials. So, with this big question, uh, research question in mind, um, I came to the, the approach that we could take would be evolutionary algorithms. So I'm going to do a brief evolutionary algorithms detour just to give you a flavor for, if you don't have a background in evolutionary algorithms, here's your primer on an, uh, evolutionary approaches. So there are four key pillars of evolution that we're going to leverage in using evolutionary algorithms or evolutionary optimization um, in an artificial system. If you're thinking about it as an optimization problem, instead of having a single individual, a single entity that we're tweaking and optimizing over, we're going to have a population of individuals that we're trying to optimize um, simultaneously. And with that population, we're going to have diversity. The individuals in the population, the different candidate solutions to the problem that we're trying to optimize are going to have different characteristics. We also have a notion of heredity. Characteristics are transmitted over generations. And we have the idea of selection. This is survival of the fittest, natural selection. So you, you in this case, the individuals make more offspring than an environment can support. Those that are better at surviving make more offspring. And those that are not, die off. So in artificial evolution, we're trying to do the automatic generation of solutions to hard problems. There are similarities between natural and artificial evolutions. We have a notion of phenotype and genotype in artificial evolution. Genotype is the actual genetic representation that's manipulated during the optimization process. Phenotype is the actual thing that we're trying to optimize. And then we have those four key pillars of evolution, population, diversity, selection, and inheritance that are part of our artificial evolution process. Now, there are some key differences between natural evolution and artificial evolution. In artificial evolution, we have a concept of a fitness score, which is the measure of performance of an individual um, on the particular problem that we're trying to solve. In natural evolution, what the fitness score is is a little bit fuzzy to try to evaluate, but we specify what the fitness actually is in our artificial evolution process. We also expect to see improvement between our initial solution um, in our, our first population and as we're evolving over time, our final population. We expect to see improvement in that fitness score over the course of artificial evolution. So if you wanted to apply evolutionary algorithms to your problem, there are a set of steps that you would define to start using evolutionary algorithms. So you have to define a genetic representation, what your genome is gonna look like. Um, you have to define a fitness function, so how you're actually going to evaluate the solution. Uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, this is actually, I think the absolute hardest thing to do um, for evolutionary algorithms. Um, you have to choose a selection method. There are a lot of selection methods that are in the literature for evolutionary algorithms. Um, so that, that's a little bit easier to do. You have to choose how you're gonna do reproduction so that you have heredity from one generation to the next. Um, those operations typically are called crossover and mutation. Crossover takes two individuals and produce, produces children that inherit characteristics from both of those individuals. 
Um, whereas mutation is exactly what it sounds like. It's small tweaks on an individual um, randomly inserted um, into that individual. You have to choose how you're going to be analyzing your data across the course of evolution, and you have to choose some sort of stopping condition. Now, this is my absolute favorite thing about evolutionary algorithms. They are applicable to any problem domain as long as you come up with the right representation, fitness, and genetic operators, the crossover and mutation approaches. My favorite sort of joke about this in the evolution community is that evolutionary algorithms are the second best way to solve any problem. When you have absolutely no idea how to start to solve your particular problem, evolution's a good, a good path to start down. This is why I came to evolution for designing spiking neural networks, because I had absolutely no idea where to start with all of the freedom to design what a spiking neural network should look like. So in a very basic um, evolutionary algorithm, and in particular, this is a, a genetic algorithm, um, your individuals in your population are represented by binary strings, ones and zeros, and you have randomly initialized individuals in your starting population. You use a fitness function to evaluate them and you get a score associated with how they're performing. You use some sort of selection procedure to preferentially select better performing individuals while still um, maintaining some diversity. So we, in this case, it's picking the top three uh, and not just the, the top one individual. Reproduction operations happen. In this case, they're cloning uh, the individuals um, relative to how many how their fitness score is. So the higher fitness gets more clones in the reproduction process. And then crossover and mutation takes place. Here, crossover is happening between these two individuals where it's sort of split um, partway through the, the um, genome and the pieces are swapped on one side. Uh, and then mutations are just random bit flips in this, um, in this setup. So this is great and all. Um, this is what's used for a lot of, of evolutionary algorithm approaches where they take this genome and then they turn it into whatever they're trying to optimize. But this didn't really work for me in terms of spiking neural networks. Like I, there wasn't a good way to translate a binary genome or even a, a link, a, a genome of real valued um, numbers to do what I wanted to do, which was optimize the network topology and the parameters simultaneously or at least give the freedom to be able to do that with the, the procedure. So with that in mind, um, this work started when I was a graduate student. It was my, my dissertation, um, and it's continued over the last decade. Um, and so we developed this system called Evolutionary Optimization for Neuromorphic Systems, or EONS. And the way that it works is that we have a problem that we want to solve, and we have a neuromorphic hardware implementation that we want to use to solve that problem. And we assume we know absolutely nothing about what the spiking neural network should look like to solve that problem, except for we know what the inputs to our network are going to be and we know what the outputs need to look like. That's it. And so we start with a bunch of random guesses as to what our spiking neural network should start to look like. Um, so you can see here I have four individuals, four different small spiking neural networks. That's what fit on the slide. Usually our populations have between 100 and 1,000 individuals. Um, and they have different numbers of neurons, they have different numbers of synapses, and the connectivity is different, the parameters are different across the individuals in the population. The one thing that they all have in common is they have the same input neurons and they have the same output neurons. So all of these can sort of interface in that way, they, they talk to the application in the same way. And so what we do with eons is we evaluate each of these networks and we rank them. Um, so what this entails with neuromorphic systems is we take each of these networks, we load them onto the hardware or a simulation of the hardware, and then we run them on the application or a simulation of the application, and we get a score for how it's doing. So if it's doing classification, that score might be accuracy on the training set. Um, if it's doing some sort of control task, then it's, you know, the reward associated with how well it did for that particular episode um, or average across multiple episodes, but you get a score for how well it's performing, which allows you to rank them from best to worst. Now, I will note that the definition, once again, of what that fitness function, how you come up to that score is, can have a tremendous impact on performance. You'll see some examples of that in a moment. Um, but once we have those scores, we do selection and we just use a selection approach from the literature and evolutionary algorithms. We use tournament selection, if you happen to be familiar with it, to preferentially select better performing networks while still maintaining diversity. Those are our parents. And then we do custom reproduction operations to produce children. We use both crossover and mutation. 
But in our network representation, crossover functions a little bit different from how it functions in the um, binary string example. So this particular child um, in our child population is a result of crossover between the first two individuals in our, our parent population. Um, it inherited sort of this inner uh, subnetwork from this parent, and it inherited the outer um, components from the other parents. So we're taking components from each of the parents to produce a child. So it's inheriting characteristics from both. Um, this particular network was a, a product of a couple of mutations um, to this parent. Um, in particular, there is a synapse deletion as well as a couple of parameter changes. For example, you know, the color of the synapse changed to indicate that the parameter values changed in some way. So once you have the child population, you then repeat this process um, for some number of generations. We usually, um, our stopping criteria is usually based on number of generations or a fixed amount of compute time. Um, you could also have like a score threshold you want to reach for your application. Sorry, Katie, can I can I ask yes. a question? Um, so is one of the constraints that they have to be spiking neurons or is it? They, that, that... they don't have to be spiking neurons. They don't have to be neurons at all, actually. Um, we built in our latest version of, of Eons and we are on in our software in this community, you will sympathize with this. We are on version seven of, um, of the Eons uh, software iteration. Um, it is just a graph. It's just nodes and edges and it can have however many properties you want to. And then what you do is you take that graph and you map it to your hardware backend. Um, and the 10 lab software framework actually does that mapping um, for you. So you don't have to, to do the conversions. Right. Uh, but we've used it also to evolve like, like circuits of, of logic gates um, instead of like networks, any sort of in, spiking neural networks, any sort of network representation you could use eons to evolve with. And it supports, um, right now it supports nodes and edges. Um, and those nodes and edges can have any number of parameters of different types. They can be categorical or um, floating point continuous values if you need them to. Um, or um, our network level, our graph level, uh, can also have parameters that you can optimize as well. Yeah, nice. So very flexible. Thanks. Iteration seven. We've learned a lot across those seven uh, iterations. Um, so if you know anything about evolutionary algorithms, um, you probably know that they can be slow to converge. There's a reason the acronym is EONS. It's not as bad as you think, though. Um, in all of the applications that I'm going to show you, every single one of them converged in under 24 hours, most of them in under two hours, and they did so under, in, under those time constraints on like a laptop. So I'm not talking about, even though I have a supercomputer and you, you can use supercomputing to get to better solutions faster. What I'm going to be talking about, we used like laptop workstation, not big supercomputers. And when we do use the big supercomputers, I'm going to tell you when we're using them and we're using small parts of them. So yes, they can be slow, um, but there's a lot of reasons why we want to use evolution in the context of neuromorphic and why, even though it's sort of our second best solution to, uh, to problems, I would argue we don't know the first best solution quite yet for how to design arbitrary spiking neural networks. Um, when we do, may maybe we can pivot to that, but we've been using this for a decade and we've used it for a lot of different reasons. Um, so I'm gonna take you through those reasons and tell you about some of the results we've seen so far. So one of the big ones for our group is that it's applicable to a wide variety of different tasks. Um, so I'm gonna give you some examples. So one example is we've worked with researchers at Fermi National Accelerator Lab, which is a Department of Energy lab just outside Chicago. Um, they had data from a high energy physics experiment, Minerva. It was simulated data. And it turns out that a lot of the data that comes off these um, high energy physics experiments is event-based data. So it maps really naturally to spiking neural networks. Um, so neuromorphic fits very naturally in analyzing high energy physics data. And the high energy physics community is really interested in neuromorphic, not because it's low power, they don't care. They have a, you can see the detector here. This is like a little person for scale. It's a school bus size detector. They don't care about power. They care about speed. So they do still care about custom hardware. So because it was sort of naturally event-driven data, we wanted to look at this from a spiking neural network perspective and they had a classification pass. 
Um, so what happens is in this data, um, there is a neutrino beam hitting this detector coming through the green plate. Um, these are all different pixels along the detector. And what they wanted to do is look at the data that came off the detector and identify the region, the horizontal region along the detector where an initial, uh, an initial neutrino nucleus interaction event occurred. Um, so the approach that they were taking at Fermilab was a traditional deep learning approach, like a convolutional neural network approach. And they actually came to the group that I was in at Oak Ridge and said, hey, we know y'all do neural architecture search because some of my colleagues used evolutionary algorithms to do neural architecture search on traditional convolutional neural networks. Can you help us build a convolutional neural network that will work on this problem? And we said, sure, but also your data is like spiking. Can we also try spiking neural networks on it? So we did that. Um, and we did both an evolutionary algorithm-based neural architecture search on the convolutional neural network, and we used eons for the spiking neural network result. And we found that the differences in accuracy are negligible here. The fact that the spiking neural network is slightly higher, that doesn't really matter in the, the, the scale of data that we were looking at. They got basically the same result. But... Here's what was interesting. This was the convolutional neural network designed using neural architecture search, mind you. This, just this layer, is a fully connected layer with 98 neurons in it. Our entire spiking neural network that got the same result was 90 neurons and 86 synapses. It was recurrent. There are cycles in it. You can see the network here on the slide. Um, it's not even fully connected. There are input neurons it's not using at all. That's why there are you know, fewer synapses than there are neurons. Um, and we just for, you know, because we could, we estimated what the energy usage would look like on a memristive neuromorphic platform because we were building memristive neuromorphic hardware. Again, high-energy physicists don't care. They're like, I don't listen. I care about speed. So smaller network, we could potentially run a lot faster. So this was very interesting to them. And this was very exciting for us because it, it made sense here to apply a spiking neural network to this data because it was natively sort of event-driven. Whereas the convolutional neural network approach was converting it into frames um, and using that for the input. So this is a classification example on temporal data, um, but we can easily pivot to control. And in fact, our 10 lab research group at Tennessee really loves control. Um, for a while, every time a new undergraduate student joined our group, they had to build a control application um, to apply neuromorphic computing to. Hopefully the videos are playing and you can see them. These are some of those applications that they built. Everything from Flappy Bird to robotic navigation tasks. Um, and for actually this robotic navigation task and this one here, um, this RoboNav one uh, is a simulated robot that's trying to cover as much ground as possible um, in the environment while avoiding obstacles. We built a physical robot um, for that and, and it, it roams around. It's a smart Roomba. It just covers as much ground as possible and doesn't run into things along the way. And we also built a robot that does an obstacle avoidance and targeting um, task, which is what's happening in this uh, top right example. So for all of these, we're using evolution. We're using eons in exactly the same way. The only thing that we change is the fitness score. So we take the network that comes out of eons. We send it to be evaluated. And in these cases, instead of running a training set through and getting an accuracy score for how it's performing, we have it run in the simulator for the game or the, the robotic navigation task, and we get a score for how well it's doing for each of those. We can also do anomaly detection. So we are working right now with researchers from Oak Ridge National Lab's nuclear nonproliferation team um, in looking at detecting low signal noise ratio anomalies in very noisy and dynamic data environments. Um, we're, we're using one of their open data sets as our initial um, challenge here. And with our spiking neural network um, implementation, we are getting significantly better results than the baseline that they had established. Um, but we're also approaching the results that they have, the state of the art results they've gotten for deep learning approaches on this same task. And we're coming up with spiking neural networks that will fit on this particular hardware platform, which was an, a neuromorphic FPGA-based implementation um, developed at Oak Ridge, uh, that in this, uh, this constrained neuromorphic implementation, the largest network you can fit on it is 256 neurons. We are getting comparable to the best deep learning result in under 256 neurons, 4,096 synapses um, on this hardware platform. So, 
that's pretty exciting. They need that for this particular implementation because they do have extreme power constraints for the application that we're targeting. Um, using the same hardware platform uh, and pivoting to another example, this is a case where we worked with some uh, transportation researchers, um, again at Oak Ridge National Lab, but in the National Transportation Research Center. And in this case, they wanted to train a spiking neural network that could do real-time control of fuel injection in an internal combustion engine. I don't know anything about any of these applications. Like, I don't know anything about radiation detection. I don't know anything about how internal combustion engines works. I have a car. That's the extent of my knowledge. But they gave us a simulator for an engine, and they said, "These are this is your observation set. This is your action space. And I'm like, cool, I know how to do that. I can take any control problem and plug it in here. So we literally just plugged the uh, simulator of their engine into EONS as a control application. We treated it like an open AI gym environment that we just plugged right in with the observations and actions coming back and forth. Um, we did training on the Summit supercomputer, the one I was standing in front of in that picture earlier, um, but we only trained on like 20 of the 4,000 something nodes for two hours. And we trained a bunch of spiking networks during that time. Um, so we, we generated a lot. Um, and then we evaluated those uh, on the physical hardware on the physical engine. So we we actually did validate, this is the breadboarded version of that hardware you saw previously. We did validate that what we trained in simulation was able to translate into the real world as well. Um, so this is the real observations that are coming off the engine. This is real time data from the engine as well. Um, and it's making a decision at every cycle of the engine. We customized the score to um, keep the engine running normally while uh, minimizing the amount of fuel that was used. That's the engine in the lab. Um, I always say you can tell that this is real science because it's literally duct taped together. Um, bleeding edge, duct taped to make it all work. Um, this last one, uh, application wise, I wanted to just give you a flavor for some of the challenges you can run into. Um, this is uh, an ongoing uh, project that we're working on with groups of students. We have two um, groups of undergraduates that are currently um, building uh, two more of these uh, small scale um, race car demonstrations. Um, we built one. Uh, it's a one tenth scale Formula One race car. The F110 community has a lot of really nice resources, including the spec of how to build one of these, as well as a, a lot of software that you can leverage, including a simulator. Um, what is not in their normal spec is a an FPGA-based neuromorphic system that's zip tied to the top of the um, the car. But we did that. Um, it's that same hardware platform that you saw before. In this case, we did the exact same workflow we did in the engine case, where we trained in simulation, and then we used eons to produce the the spiking neural networks, and then we deployed them initially to a Jetson. We were also using this car for um, deep learning uh, uh, autonomous vehicle research. Um, we just used the CPU on the Jetson to simulate the neuromorphic system before we put microcaspian on. Um, but this was another example for us to evaluate how um, we could translate from simulation to the real world. This is my um, uh, warning about the fitness function and how difficult it can be to define to get complex behavior out of your application. Um, the key challenge with fitness functions is you have to be careful what you wish for um, when you're specifying your fitness function. Um, so I always say you start as simple as possible. And our initial fitness function for this task, we had the simulator. This is a, um, a real Formula One track. I know nothing about Formula One. This is Catalonia, um, which I know because I put it in the video there. Um, so our initial fitness function was distance traveled. So we wanted to maximize distance traveled without crashing. Now, I don't know if you can see the car. Um, it's the little black dot. It's not a bug um, that's crawling on your screen. It, if we were maximizing distance traveled, one of the things, the artifacts that we saw is that the network evolved to drive like this because driving like this is further than just driving straight. So that wasn't ideal. Um, but also we discovered something in the simulator. So we augmented our fitness function. We tried to make it so that it would not do as much weaving. And we saw this one and we're like, oh, this is amazing. But the score we were getting was weird out of the simulator. And we use their simulator. And it's because it evolved networks that did that, which it evolved to make U-turns along the track because it that was maximizing distance traveled. And that's what we told it to do. Um, so we had to augment our fitness function to uh, 
penalize weaving behavior. And also we, we penalized it for traveling significant distance over how long it should take you to drive around the track. Um, and we got a network, we got multiple networks that were performing reasonably well um, in simulation. Uh, so again, our whole shtick in our research group is we want to actually like see it do the thing in real in the real world. Um, so in order to evaluate a tiny race car, and tiny is not right, it's a one-tenth scale, it's still, you know, solid size. You got to build a racetrack. Um, this was during the pandemic, so we built uh, our first racetrack in my basement. Um, this is in my basement at my house because, you know, that's how you do it. Uh, we were still simulating the hardware. Um, we were being very cautious. We had no encouragement. It's a race car, ideally. Eventually, we want to go fast, but <laughs> we were in my basement, so not that fast. Um, we just wanted to see if it could translate what it learned in simulation, and it did. Um, I will note, we trained in simulations with real Formula One tracks. The track that is in my basement is not laid out like a real Formula One track. It is laid out in the shape of my basement. Um, so it had to be able to translate what it learned um, in simulation to, to work in the real world. Um, this is actually running with the physical hardware in the loop on top. You can see in both of these, we're still working on the weaving issue um, with the translation into the physical um, car. We have a lot of hypotheses about why that's happening on the physical car when we're not seeing it in simulation, but we're still working on the kinks and, and getting that out. And then um, I had a couple of high school Sorry. students. Yeah, go ahead. What census was it using? Just LIDAR. LIDAR, nice. Yeah, um, and it's the LIDAR that's on top of the car um, that's spinning. Um, so evolutionary algorithms are pretty intuitive. Hopefully you're getting that they're pretty intuitive, um, which means that you can communicate how to update and, and change um, the fitness function pretty easily to all sorts of people, including high school students. Um, so two uh, um, uh, last year high school students worked with me um, over the last year of their high school um, careers on updating the fitness function to encourage it to go faster. You can see one of the high school students, um, Alex, chasing the car here um, to make sure that she can grab it if it starts to crash. Their uh, part of their research goal was evaluating how they could change the fitness function to elicit different behaviors, including making it go faster. Um, again, we're still dealing with uh, weaving behaviors in some of our best performing networks. Um, uh, both of these students uh, who were in high school at the time that they completed the work, um, Alex and Amelie, are now freshmen at MIT. Um, so pretty, pretty phenomenal students, but high school students nonetheless um, who started doing neuromorphic research with us. So to give you a baseline here, our Tin Lab framework enables us also to easily swap out the algorithm that we're using on the application. So we use a different evolutionary um, algorithm approach, um, just training the weight values, but we did hyperparameter optimization on the network structure. This was a, a feed forward network um, using an evolutionary algorithm package called LEAP. We're going to use that later in our Jupyter Notebook example that I'm going to give you. We also did um, imitation learning approaches using Whetstone, which is an, an open source um, library developed at Sandia National Labs that uses backpropagation style training uh, for spiking neural networks. Uh, and we also did a reservoir computing approach. And you can see that the EONS approach not only gave us the best performance on this task, and I will note we did hyperparameter optimization on all of these, and these are the best results for each of these algorithms, but it also gave us networks that were very, very small compared to the other approaches. Okay, so now I'm going to speed through the rest of these so we have time to uh, go to the, the Jupyter Notebook. Um, EONS evolves the topology and the parameters, which means that the networks that it evolves look very different from what you might typically think of as a spiking neural network. Um, we typically have very small networks with few hidden neurons um, to the point where often these in these examples, the, their, um, the pink ones are the input neurons the blue are the output and the green are the hidden. Um, it will often evolve to tell you, I don't care about a lot of the inputs you're giving me to solve this problem. I can get reasonable accuracy by just using a small number of these. And we typically see a lot of recurrent connections. We, Unless the hardware has restrictions on what you can do, we don't put restrictions on what the connectivity can be. So we can have input to input connections, output to output, output to input. Any connectivity you can imagine it can evolve um, if, if you give it that flexibility. Um, this is an example of one of the networks evolved to uh, play a version of the Atari game Asteroids. 
Um, in this case, we equip the, the ship with um, a, a LIDAR on it as if a, some, a neuromorphic system was steering from the ship's perspective. The inputs here are the LIDAR beams uh, around the outside, and the outputs are in the middle, turning, thrusting, and firing. And the hidden neurons, there are only 10 of them, um, are just drawn around the outside edge. So again, not a network topology. You would you maybe hand tool yourself. Um, uh, let's see. We'll go into the next one. This is an example of one of our Minerva data, that high energy physics example I showed you previously. Um, in this case, our inputs are over here shown in yellow. Our outputs are shown in red. Um, and then our hidden are shown in teal. And then we have two different colored um, uh, synapses. Those are excitatory and inhibitory. Um, Again, it's a hairball of a network. There's connections going in every direction. There's inputs connected to inputs, outputs going back to inputs, and, and so on. And this is one of the networks that we trained to uh, do the F110 uh, example you just saw. Um, these are the inputs up here. These are the outputs. The inputs are coming from the LIDAR. Um, the outputs are um, steering angle and speed, and they're discrete values that it can choose from. Um, I think this case, the, the car, is, it's too small. Um, you may not be able to see it here, but it is driving the car around the, the simulation here. But this is how small the network is, and all of the networks are, are comparable in size to this that, um, that you saw in the videos previously. Okay, so topology, that's a big deal for us. Um, the other big important thing is that we can target different hardware platforms, and we can switch between them relatively easily. Again, that's the whole point um, for what we're trying to do in our research group. I won't go into the hardware details, but some examples that we've used eons to do co-design of hardware um, with memristive uh, neuromorphic systems and helping us choose different uh, metal oxide um, uh, materials to, uh, to build our memristor out of and what their impacts are going to be on the application. Um, you'll hear more about this one in a moment where we worked with biomimetic synapses. Um, and we also worked with some researchers from NIST uh, Boulder in looking at single flux quantum based neuromorphic systems and superconducting optoelectronic neurons um, and doing co design with their system uh, with applications with eons to determine what the, the um, different characteristics of their hardware should be. So, this is really just as easy as swapping out what your neuromorphic model is on the back end. Nothing about the algorithm changes, it'll just train for the particular hardware back end. That being said, it will train for the particular hardware backend. So the network that you train for a memristive based system is not going to be the best performing network for your superconducting optoelectronic system, but you wouldn't expect it to be. Um, it will operate within the characteristics and constraints of the architecture or device. We've used it to evolve under hardware constraints like limited weight precision, limited delay values, and structural constraints like connectivity restraints that, uh, that the hardware might have. And it can discover well performing networks under pretty extreme constraints. We In this case, we had um, various levels of precision in our synaptic weight value. The differences in accuracy here are relatively small um, across these simple classification tasks, but we've seen that it can evolve to pretty good solutions under whatever constraints that you're imposing on it. But this can also be used to help do that co-design process where if it can't evolve to the same sort of solution, then the characteristic that you've eliminated is actually pretty important. Um, so you want to include that. Um, one of the things that, that we've used this for is to it, use evolution. When, once again, we have a neuromorphic system where we're like, I have no idea if this is going to be useful at all. Like, can it, can it do anything? We have no idea. So some of our collaborators in the mechanical engineering department at Oak Ridge and the Center for Nanophase Material Science at, uh, uh, sorry, the mechanical engineering department at, at Tennessee and the Center for Nanophase Material Science at Oak Ridge came to me one day and we're like, so we made this thing and we think it acts like a synapse. So this thing was two water droplets encased in lipids that they squish together. It has a membrane. And then when they apply a voltage to an electrode that's pad that's below one of the water droplets on one side, it opens, in this case, allomethacin channels. You read out the current on the other side. It behaves a lot like a chemical synapse and it exhibits short-term plasticity, um, paired pulse facilitation and paired pulse depression. And it's easily fabricated on a small scale, um, by which I mean a graduate student can pipette these onto a thing um, pretty easily uh, in the lab um, and you know, not in a clean room or anything like that. So 
they made these and they showed that it had this short-term plasticity properties, but we had no idea of like, can I do anything with this? It can't hold a weight value. Like it, it's just short-term plasticity. It can't, it's not non-volatile at all. Um, so you can't store a weight value on it, but can you just use this short-term plasticity mechanism to do anything with? You can, it turns out. Um, so we implemented a model of the behavior, we implemented a simulator for it, and we trained on a variety of applications. The one that I'm highlighting here is an EEG classification task, um, classifying between healthy and epileptic um, EEG signals. We got comparable accuracy with the other neuromorphic hardware backends that we had tested on this task previously. Six neurons and six synapses where the synapses were implemented um, using these synaptic device models. The only thing that we said is they had to be able to be excitatory or inhibitory, although in this task, just excitatory was enough. Um, and it had to be able to, to implement a delay in some place. Um, in this case, we rolled the delay into as an axon delay um, as part of our neuron model, which was a solid state neuron model. So we were able to go from, is this even, can we do anything with this to building a simulator to evaluate evaluating with eons and saying, yeah, it turns out you can um, actually learn to use the unique characteristics of the device. You can combine evolutionary optimization with other training approaches. So if you have a training approach that defines your weights, for example, of your um, synaptic connections, you can absolutely nest that inside and just use eons to discover the, um, the topology. We've also used it to evolve reservoirs. So rather than saying, I just came up with an untrained reservoir, I can use eons to evolve a reservoir. Um, for different tasks. And using eons to evolve the reservoir will get you much more consistently to a better performing reservoir than if you're just randomly generating or if you're just if you're doing like a manual search for a reservoir. Um, and I can point you to some of our publications where we talk about this. We've also used on top of eons on the outside a Bayesian hyperparameter optimization to, to tune the hyperparameters of eons and things like the, the input encoding method, as well as hardware characteristics. Um, and we can use the Bayesian hyperparameter optimization just as an outer loop of optimization, where eons now is the inner loop that's determining the structure and the parameters of the system. And we've used this to, to do multi-objective optimization to produce more accurate, more efficient, and faster solutions. We did the multi-objective within Bayesian, but we can also do multi-objective natively within eons. So we've done multi-objective optimization with eons by updating our fitness function to include other factors besides just performance on the task. You can augment your fitness function to minimize energy usage, to minimize network size, and to improve resiliency. You can update your fitness function to encourage whatever property you want of your network. So we've done it to decrease network size and, and um, decrease energy usage. We've also done it where we augmented our fitness function to simultaneously perform well on the original network on the task, that's the original score here, minimize the network size, and perform well in the face of perturbations to the network. So using this, you can optimize for certain types of failures or, or um, noise that you might see in your neuromorphic implementation. And in doing this, we were able to significantly increase the resiliency by including that as a metric as part of our evolution. So finally, Yes. Can it take a while for eons to converge? It can. It's not as bad as you think it is, but it can take a while. But if you happen to have a lot of compute resources, evolution scales really nicely. Um, so we have implemented a scalable, what's called island model. And what happens in an island model is you have different eons processes that are running independently, but you allow them to communicate. So they can send their best individuals as migrants. They can go to other populations, sharing information among the populations. So we did some evaluation on the Summit supercomputer at Oak Ridge, up to 1,024 cores. The Summit system has like hundreds of thousands of cores, so we didn't go to that level. We did uh, train on all 300,000 cores of the Titan supercomputer using an island model um, for eons, not because we had to, just because we could, um, just so we could show what the scalability was. Um, but using the island models with migration, you get consistently better results. And if you have your right hyperparameters tuned for your process, you get to better results faster. So some of our ongoing efforts that I just want to mention, because if you're interested in collaborating, reach out. And any of these features are resonating with you, like reach out. We're currently working on evolving plasticity rules for online and on-chip learning. 
We're looking at indirect and developmental encodings for scalable evolution. So rather than directly evolving the graph structure, we're evolving rules to build the network. Um, we're working on cooperative coevolution for multi-agent systems. So instead of evolving a single um, network to work by itself on the problem, evolving multiple networks that work well together. Um, we are always, always, always doing application hardware co-design, especially for emerging devices and neuromorphic computing. And as I mentioned earlier, we're moving beyond neuromorphic implementations as well. Um, in particular, I'm currently working on a project uh, with some folks at Sandia National Labs applying eons and evolutionary algorithms to do co-design for probabilistic computing as well. And we are also studying impact of encoding and decoding approaches on performance. We have already seen that there is tremendous impact on the application um, performance based on the encoding approach that you're choosing for how you're converting your data into spikes. Um, and we are currently studying how decoding also impacts that performance. So to quickly summarize before I go to an example, um, we are using evolution to uh, study neuromorphic systems in a variety of ways to evaluate and deploy on different applications, to do co-design, to meet devices where they are, to leverage their characteristics, but also operate within their constraints, to improve the resiliency of neuromorphic implementations. And for us, it's also helping us understand what is the computational power of a spiking neural network when we are letting it evolve to whatever structure it needs to solve the problem. Um, I will note, I think that evolutionary algorithms, of course, I'm a bit biased, can play a great role now as we're exploring the possibilities of new algorithmic approaches. In the future, I don't think that evolution is the right way to determine the parameters of a network. I think we're gonna be coming up with lots of different algorithmic approaches we already have for how to determine things like synaptic weight values, but I do think they will continue to play a role in the development of topologies um, for spiking neural networks, and even as these new algorithmic approaches emerge. So, I wanted to share with y'all an example. Um, Eons is not yet open source, although we do share with collaborators. So please feel free to reach out if you're interested. Um, I'm gonna put this, hopefully I may exit and put this link in the chat um, so that you can all can access this. I hope everybody will be able to see this. I would um, run it in, um, run it on uh, collaboratory. Um, if you are going to run, but for now, I'll just briefly go over. Um, this is an example where we're using evolutionary algorithms to just evolve the weights of a spiking neural network. Implemented, uh, the spiking neural network is implemented in SNN Torch. Um, and the evolutionary algorithm is using Leap, which is the library for evolutionary algorithms in Python. Um, the reason I'm using Leap here is because Leap has a scalable implementation. Um, so that if you do have a lot of compute resources, you can leverage those compute resources. Although in this case, we're using a serialized implementation. So I will go ahead and, and play this along. Um, so SNN Torch is the spiking neural network package. Leap is the evolutionary algorithm package. And then we're going to use the cart poll task from the OpenAI gym as the task that we're going to try to solve. So... I think, I don't know how many of you were at the SNN Torch. There is an SNN Torch uh, talk in this series. So there's a YouTube um, uh, talk, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the weird thing we're doing with SNN Torch is instead of using um, a variant on uh, gradient descent to come up with the weights, um, we are passing the weights in from our evolutionary algorithm. And we're setting the weights in the layer here from the genome that we're defining in our evolutionary algorithm. So we're still using the forward path as it would normally be implemented in SNN Torch, um, but we are setting the weights based on our evolutionary algorithms. So then here, this is the problem that we're going to try to solve using Leap. Um, in this particular case, uh, this is our fitness function. Our individual is our weight set for our network. This is the creation of that SNN torch that's in the previous cell um, based on the weights from our, uh, our individual and our population. And then we're gonna use the OpenAI gym. Uh, we're gonna run five episodes on the cart poll task, um, getting the actions from our network, doing a forward pass, and then getting the observations, reward, and other information back from the environment. 
I will note this is the old version of OpenAI Gem. Um, they've updated their their return space on their observation and reward and, and so on now. Um, so if you do install Gem locally, you may have to update this to reflect those changes. So down here, we're importing Gem again. Do that, but we have our carpool environment and we're specifying the structure of our network. Um, and calculating the total number of weights, the total length of the genome. In this case, our genome is a bunch of floating point values. And then this is the leap code that is actually going to run the evolutionary algorithm. So we're creating our uh, set of individuals, which are um, have the total number of weights that we need for our network between negative one and one. And we are solving the open AI gem problem, which was defined in one of the earlier cells. We evaluate our initial population. Um, so we get all of the fitness scores there. And then we loop over our various generations. We perform selection, tournament selection. In this case, that's one of the evolutionary algorithm approaches. We do cloning, then mutation, then crossover. We evaluate the children. And in this case, we've added another component, which is elitist survival. The best individuals from the parent network will survive along with the children. Um, in some basic cases of evolutionary algorithms, the entire parent population is wiped out and replaced by the children. In this case, we're maintaining some of the parents in the, the next generation. And we're getting all of the fitnesses um, here uh, and showing what our maximum fitness is. So if we run this and on the collaboratory's resources, this is quite slow. You can parallelize this real, relatively easily. And if, in fact, if you did run it on your local machine, it would be quite a bit faster. Um, it will start to print uh, and ev the evolved network solutions um, showing the maximum fitness value. And then you can look at the best uh, performing network after the fact by looking at the, um, the genome of the network that is evolved along the way. Um, so as this is running, um, I will pause and ask if anybody has any questions, um, or if you encounter any issues with this, you're also free to email me as this is running. I have a question, not, not uh, strongly related to the code, but... Uh, uh... Uh, to the steps that you listed before. Uh, uh, you said that your evolutionary algorithm, or, or however, your evolutionary framework is uh, really constrained by the hardware in a certain sense, by the deploying platform. Yes. Uh, because you can come up with uh, a extensively different uh, networks that are more or with uh, certain parameters. So, and I saw also that in most cases, as a prototype, at least uh, you deployed the two FPGAs. Uh, are there any, any, any other cases in which you use the actual uh, neuromorphic ASICs uh, or uh, FPGAs turned out to be always uh, the less painful, let's say, way of uh, deploying your solution? No, so that's a great question. So we, because our group is doing like architectural exploration, that's why we're using FPGAs to prototype different neuromorphic architectures and evaluate those. Our group is also custom fabricating our own neuromorphic systems. But if you happen to have a neuromorphic hardware platform that has like a really nice simulator or your hardware is such that you can run it in the loop with eons, you can do that. So we've actually, we tried with Intel to, to run with Loihi in the loop. We ran into issues with the communication bottleneck going back and forth to the hardware. Now this was before they have the simulator. We're actually actively working on integrating Lava um, as the simulation backend so that we can evolve networks for Loihi now. But if you have a simulator that's, that is you know, similar to your hardware, or if you your hardware is relatively similar to a pre-existing simulation platform like Brian 2 or Nest or something like that, we integrate with all of those and you can just specify um, the way that those would perform there and then we can tailor to that particular backend. Um, we're very interested in running on real hardware, but our challenge that we've seen with the real hardware is that communication bottleneck um, for actually running networks and evaluating them. It took a lot longer than we were expecting to reprogram Loihi with different candidate networks or different populations, which slowed everything down. There's a this question a, in the- Yep, sorry, this is evolving along and, and I will 
pop back up the, the slides as well. There's a question by Gabriel Bassett. Uh, have you attempted to evolve a network for training embeddings? No, we have not. But if you're interested and have a good idea for how to formulate that, I would be happy to chat. Mm -hmm. Which um, I'd actually taken this slide out, but we like to collaborate. So if you have hardware or algorithms or applications, reach out and I'll, I'll put my contact information up in a moment. I actually have another question, so, uh, sure. always related to the hardware. So since uh, in this case, you need the uh, extreme customizability, let's say, you need uh, to play as much as you want with the hardware. And since you have been produce, uh, deploying until now on FPGAs, isn't maybe FPGAs or programmable hardware with uh, in the future some uh, specialized IPUs like signing is doing with machine learning, a special art blocks uh, in their uh, FPGAs actually be the solution. Also because in there, there is a really established framework of, uh, I, I work extensively with that platform. So, so that's what comes to my mind. There is a really established framework of Q simulation starting from C++ or C code. Mm -hmm. Uh, really easy to go back and forth with uh, actual real processor embedded on the boards. Uh, now I think they have also server classes, uh, server class FPGA, the Alvo uh, family. So instead of, uh, in this case, for the, mm, instead of searching for architecture, isn't uh, maybe the best idea to go for uh, an architecture that gives you as much freedom as possible uh, and uh, use that as a deployment. Also, I'm thinking about what Fermilab did with HLS for ML mm -hmm. uh, when they use that. So, so you're you're talking specifically about using the evolution in combination with programmable hardware to determine what the architecture should even look like for the hardware? Yes. Yeah, yes. So yes, we are very interested in doing that as well. So when we're using the FPGAs, we're typically we're targeting a, a custom ASIC of, of building a programmable neuromorphic implementation, but we have a fixed ne neuron model. We have a fixed synapse model when we're evaluating it on the FPGA. So we're not leveraging the inherent programmability of the FPGA right now, but as part of the co-design process, that is something that we are actively doing is exploring different architectural decisions that you can customize for your particular application. And in that case, programmable hardware, whether that be FPGA or you know, other types of programmable hardware, FPAAs, for example, um, you could leverage those to, to customize there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity as well. So uh, until now, every time you deployed, you actually wrote your custom RTL code or uh, did you use some? Uh... It is it is a custom RTL that that is specific we're developing an architecture that we will eventually we are actually fabricating as well um, as a custom asic it is a programmable neuromorphic architecture so we load the programmable neuromorphic rtl onto the fpga and then we can swap out different network um, configurations on that the programmable neuromorphic substrate um, not leveraging the programmability of the fpga i hope that makes sense i'm not the hardware person other people do that I make the networks that are deployed <laughs> to, okay. to these things. No, no, because um, in this case, since uh, mm, the neuro, uh, once you fix an architecture, maybe you have also have to fix a certain type of synapses, uh, yes, type of axons and so on. Maybe all, always uh, making a reference to the HLS for ML uh, case. Wouldn't it uh, be better to? take advantage of, I don't know, approaches like high level synthesis so that whatever you need, you actually deploy without deploying something that- Without picking really ahead of time. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that, that's a fantastic point. We have not done it historically because typically we have a particular hardware platform that we're targeting, but there is no reason that you couldn't use this to design that as well. And like I said, we're using it to design, to pick our architectural components um, and optimize those but we haven't done it with the hardware in the loop. We're doing it just in simulation. So there's a, there's a huge opportunity in that space, absolutely. Um, okay, I will, well, 
I'm going to briefly just advertise. I'm the general chair for the International Conference on Neuromorphic Systems, ICONS. It's going to be in August in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The paper submission deadline is April 15th. We extend it by two weeks every year. The extended deadline will be April 30th, so you have more time than you think. Um, April 30th, though, is the, the final deadline for ICONS. The program co-chairs are Miriam Parsa from George Mason University, whose house I'm sitting in right now, and Malika Pavan um, uh, from ETH. Um, so if you're interested in submitting, please check out our website, icons.ornl.gov, um, for all of the information, the full call for papers um, and the submission site. And then I will thank my collaborators and my funding agency, and I will put my contact information up on the slide here. Um, please reach out if you're interested or you have questions or want to follow up in any way through any of these mechanisms. Um, and thank you all for playing along with me on evolution and neuromorphics. Thanks a lot, Katie. Um, there, do we have time for one more question? Or yeah, I, yes, I do have to drop off in like three minutes, but yes. No problem. How do you reason about the topologies inside the networks? Oh, your, that's a great question. <laughs> your evolutionary algorithm clearly generates better generations over time. Can you, um, or are you using that to reason in a mathematical or geometrical sense? Not during evolution, but um, we do try to reason about the architectures that are produced after the fact. So, and, and we do that currently manually, but so we we actually trace through the networks are small enough that we can do that, but I'm not like a graph theorist or we we've talked we've you know talked in our group about doing things like detecting um, useful substructures in the networks based on network activity or substructures that are common across lots of well performing networks. Graph isomorphism is an MP hard problem. What other graph characteristics we might look like, look for that we could do in real time. I'm working with people where we're actively looking at how we can analyze these network structures and try to identify that. It's a really hard problem, but a really fun one. So we're working on it, but I don't have any like anything really cool to show you just quite yet on it. Cool. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time. Really interesting talk. Uh, as I said, this will be this recording will be put on YouTube, and um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And, um, have a nice day. See you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.